So it's like you're watching, you're, you know, you're <laughs> looking at, you're looking at something and, and um, you're trying to listen at the same time. And I'll, I'll, I'll go like 15 minutes and be like, well, I didn't, I didn't retain anything that I just listened yeah. to, but. It's good for drive. In the car on a long drive. Yeah, drives or, or walks. Yeah. I was gonna say, like recently taking John out for like long, like two hour walks. If I'm without Jen, I just throw the headphones in and I just listen to a book. Yeah. yeah. So, so you can't hear him when he cries. No, I mean I turn it. Down. <laughs> I usually do the one headphone, <laughs> so I can get him in one ear and then get the book in the other ear. But no, it's good. Hey, Rez. Hey, guys. Hey, Reza. How's it going, Colleen? Um, Good. All right. So, Colleen, welcome to the NCR podcast. Thanks, guys. This is what we do now. Since we're in quarantine, we just started doing the video versions of it. Oh, well, there's a video. Is this going to be on video as well? Yeah, we'll do video and audio. I got to change. Oh, come on. You got the NCR t uh, sweater <laughs> on. That was planned. That was planned. That's good. But it's actually funny because now that we just do it all by video. We've got someone lined up for like every day for the next three weeks. Whereas before we were just like hopelessly waiting for someone to walk into the gym worth interviewing, oh. so like get a couple of members here and there. But now we're just like everyone from home, jump on your computer. We'll just interview you anywhere, anytime. It's great. That way you can spread it out over months. Yeah. So exactly. like yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah. We could bang And it's it just, this is, this is uh this is easier to get us three together at the same time too i've seen these guys more in the last three weeks than i have in the last six months that's true so true that's so yeah true. so colleen we wanted to get you on here uh for a whole bunch of reasons but mainly because you're such a badass <laughs> in a whole bunch of different ways uh, your career just the fact that you combine uh, you know, being a, su a successful doctor and a career in the military with being a mom, a wife, uh, a really good CrossFitter. Um, you're a, a colonel. Am I right on that? You're a colonel in yeah. the military in the Canadian Armed Forces. You're you're a doctor, uh, an MD. Uh, you were you were practicing family medicine for a while. Then you, up until recently, I think you were an emergency physician too. Yeah. And then, and now you're focused more on the mental health side. Uh, less, that was one of my jobs. Yeah. Okay. So. That was one of your jobs. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that stuff. But you know, on top of all, of all that, um, like I said, you've got a daughter, you've got a husband who's also a firefighter and was also in the military. And, and last year you were, you were one spot for making it to the CrossFit games as a master or, or spot. I was 14th. It may yeah. as well have been one. <laughs> <laughs> may as well have been. That's true. So um, why, why don't we start with uh, just a little bit of your path, like how, what it means to be a colonel in the military and like how you got to that position. Like where, where did you start up in the military? And why don't you just explain like what a colonel is first? Like what does a colonel do? Like what's the difference between a colonel and someone else in the military? Uh... Well, okay, so from the rank structure, uh, all physicians are officers, and uh, within the health branch, um, you have a number of ranks from sub-lieutenant to all the way to general, major general, lieutenant general. So within that, normally the working physician at the at the clinic level and interacting and doing the clinical care you're sort of at the captain major level um, that's where really the one-on-one -on -one and individual care sort of happens um, for our specialists like someone like Soraya who's an internal medicine specialist they, they continue to do their clinical care throughout their career in um, in civilian hospitals, that's where they maintain all their skills and, and keep up to date. For family physicians, um, what we call the general duty medical officers, and some of us who've also got our certification in emergency medicine, our career path looks a little bit different. And over the period of time from when you join as a physician to the development of your career path, you go from delivering more individual care to learning about how 
the health system works, you get more into the occupational medicine elements. So flight, uh, flight medicine, dive medicine, uh, submarine medicine, um, some of the, the preventative medicine, the occupational health components of what it is to be a military physician, mm -hmm. plus the administrative and leadership components of functioning within um, the military institution and the military health system. So as you move up in rank, so captain, major, lieutenant, colonel, colonel, you know, it, you you move up sort of a stream that becomes more leadership and administrative and health system focused right. and moving away from the individual care. So at the level of colonel, um, so I've been a colonel this is my third year, um, I was more in get get more into running a directorate so my first directorate as a colonel was a director of mental health which you you alluded to which was really looking at um helping run and um oversee the mental health programs that are being developed and implemented for the canadian armed forces so that was my focus plus linking into what other government agencies are doing or organizations are doing and what the the um, health jurisdictions uh, across the country are doing. So that was kind of the, the focus. Cool. Over the past yeah. year, so in August, I was, um, I started at the Canadian Forces College. So I was selected for um, something called the National Security Program. So really since August, I've uh, been focused more on that, sort of going back and forth from Toronto during the week. And that's a program, um, not health related at all, but it's for senior um, leaders in Canadian Armed Forces specifically, as well as public servants and international military. So we have a small group of about 29 of us um, from around the world that are uh, looking more at geopolitical strategy, how the government works, and sort of developing institutional leadership skills. Hmm. That's really cool. And I imagine so going moving backwards when you were practicing emergency medicine and then family medicine that's sort of like you're as you moved uh from one practice to the next that's sort of yeah. that would also mirror your move up in rank kind of thing a, a little bit i had a sort of an unusual path because i came from i was a family physician first um, I was working in a beautiful area called the Crow's Nest Pass in southern Alberta. So Renee, Renee and I were both working there. And after several years there, um, the opportunity to join the Canadian Forces came up. And I thought, well, it's just a four-year commitment and uh, I'll give it a go. Uh, what could go wrong? Um, <laughs> And, uh, and that was in 2003. So starting off, yeah, very clinically focused, um, very uh, care delivery. Um, that was also the timing I went to Afghanistan for seven months. Um, so all that was happening. And then as, as I developed, eventually I got, I, I took the exam for the emergency medicine stuff more out of interest and um, it's just something I really wanted to do. And then a few years later, I actually uh, did my master's of public health, which was also related to the work I was doing, but, um, and linked to sort of the more the preventative medicine and occupational health components. Mm -hmm. so you, question so, for you. Um, how did you go, like, what did that transition look like from family medicine to the military? Like, how did that, did you just, did someone approach you or did you like, that seems like a pretty, like, I'm just thinking of like my family doctor and like what it would take for her to, to join the military and be like, how, how did that process, what did that process look like? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. That's, um, it was over a couple of years. So when we went to the Crow's Nest Pass, which was beautiful and the colleagues were amazing and, and we really enjoyed that. Uh, we sort of committed to sort of a three or four year plan that we would take a look at, is this still where we want to be? Um, is this where we want to be in 20 years? Are there, is there anything else we want to consider? Obviously we didn't have kids at that time. And I think around the three or four year mark, we kind of went, you know, maybe, maybe what, what else could we, what else would be interesting? Are there any other um, opportunities out there? And it, it just so happened that I had 
I think four or five colleagues during my residency who had all done the um, what they call M MOTP, Military Occupational Training Program, so residency through the military. And so I knew of them, and I had heard from one of them at a conference, and she was talking about all the stuff that she was doing, and they thought it sounded really interesting. Renee had been in the military as a reservist, infantry uh, reserve officer, so I had been exposed to it on that side of it, but it wasn't anything that, um, I had really considered at that point in time. So it took a couple of, you know, talking to my friend uh, Annette and then later going back and then speaking to other, other folks back and forth before I decided to commit. And um, at the time they were extremely short of positions. There was a bit of a signing bonus, which actually then made it um, possible to sort of pay off some student loans and, and do some other things and pay the overhead of the practice I was in and some of the other things that would have been barriers otherwise. Uh, so that was a transition. I mean, I, I don't know that I would have done it had I not been confident at tying into the CrossFit element. I don't think I would have necessarily been as um, open to it if I didn't feel I could physically do it. And so that was part of a, a, a unique element of going to the military that I felt I could, I could tackle that piece. Um, the medicine, I obviously had tackled that piece. It was really just kind of understanding an entire new institution and, and getting adapted to that. So was there a, a big, um, was, there, was there a big lifestyle change for you guys from that? Going from basically being your own boss and having your own practice and getting into a very institutionalized, you know, uh, military type? Uh, a, mm, yes. <laughs> I was just thinking yeah. about this because I'm thinking like, you know, to go from, I was in my mid thirties at the time um, and then going to basic training. Yeah. That, that was, um, that was that was a bit different and I think yeah he sort of I had to really wrap my head around the fact that um people are telling me what to do 24 7 but it's a process and this is just something I'm gonna have to go through and and deal with and get institutionalized like everybody else mm -hmm. and um so yeah it was a little bit of a a headspace change for sure and then again understanding that whole chain of command element when you're used to making all your own decisions yeah, and always and, and and being right and knowing a lot of things right like in yeah. your environment of, of a family medicine or basically any doctor i mean they're usually in in the the position where they're the ones who have the answers and they're the ones who who know everything yeah. like going in and changing from that to the military side um that was that was a tough challenge that was and even the kind of medicine you're delivering because now you have to consider um their chain of command, how you communicate private, like in maintaining privacy of the patient, but also communicating with the chain of command about whether uh, a member can uh, continue with their duties or not, um, the administrative elements. So there's, there's lots of layers that needed to be learned, not only about just being a military officer, but also practicing medicine in that environment. So that, that takes a good year to two years to really wrap your head around. Like it's, it's a process. That takes some time. So did you go through basic training out west then? Were you guys still living in Alberta? Uh, so yes. So we were living yeah. in Edmonton at the time. And I went to Saint-Jean, Quebec. Saint-Jean, um, uh, right by Montreal there. Yeah. yeah. It 13 weeks of fun. Is that where everyone does basic training? That is the big mega complex now, yeah. So there used to be one in... Chilliwack, but I don't think they have that one open anymore. So it, almost everyone goes through their initial phases in Saint Jean. Cool. That's cool. Really cool. I imagine. Uh, I imagine that you having practiced primary care, being more on the acute side with emergency, and then now, you know, having experienced the administrative side, uh, you have a pretty unique perspective on the entire sort of medical field and just like medicine in general in Canada, like compared to probably, you know, I would say that 
the large majority of doctors probably end up just specializing and not moving around so much. Um, like what, what is your perspective and how can, how would you think that's like a little bit different from most other people, most other doctors? It's hard to, it's hard to know whether my perspective is all that different. It's certainly different from where it was 15 years ago from, from a personal perspective. Um, the, the you, idea of, do you have like a new, do you have like a new, now that you've gone through all those different phases and, and looking yeah. back on, you know, having done primary care and now understanding what goes on there, but then adding in the layer of the acute and then also administratively speaking, like you must have like just a, a larger appreciation for what goes on in our health system as a whole. Yeah, well, certainly the military health system and having that transfer into the civilian system is 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 certainly um, uh, part of that. But yes, understanding um, the implications of uh, how we do medicine, which is often very reactive um, at the tactical level, um, how prevention is, is such a critical component, but often overlooked in, in the civilian healthcare system, how politics, economics, um, and, you know, how, how that all plays into the entire health system and the health of a population is all part of, I guess, yeah, the growth over the years of what I've done, plus uh, exposure to, you know, the deployments that I've done and, and the interactions with, you know, Public Health Agency of Canada, Health Canada, and some of those agencies. So it, it's certainly, um, I'd like to think I have a much broader idea of the challenges being faced um, throughout the healthcare system. For sure. Which, Especially uh, right now, maybe, right? Which is a good segue, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, especially now. Well, I, I, I just want to ask you before, though, before we talk about that is because I, uh, I didn't know that you were deployed. I guess I don't know if it's deployed the right term, but when you did you go to Africa for the Ebola crisis? Is that what I saw? Yes. Yeah. OK, cool. When was that? Uh, that was 2015. So it was towards the tail end of our contribution. Um, the, the pandemic curve was already sort of dying out, but that was. Um, I think it was like 2013 to 16 was the main bulk of it. Yeah, 14 to 16 was was definitely the the, the bulk of it. And what happened was um, the NGOs were no longer feeling comfortable to go in and assist. And so Canada partnered with the UK uh, on the medical side to contribute to something called uh, to an Ebola treatment center focused specifically on healthcare providers. So healthcare providers who became ill could come to that particular um, treatment center. And we staffed that uh, along with the United Kingdom for, uh, I'm gonna say six, a total of six months. And um, through three different um, groups of deployments. And I was on that third one. Ebola is a virus, right? It sure is, yeah. It which was, is yeah. what COVID's a virus too, right? So what's like, what's the, what are the differences between Ebola and COVID-19? Um, like Ebola makes it, from what I, I read, it makes you much more sick when you get it. Yeah, so we, the, the transmission, the type of transmission of Ebola is different. So it's usually through um, human to human contact. Right. Uh, so not so much as the aerosolized piece. It's a little bit tougher to transmit but the uh, mortality rate is upwards of more than 50%. So if you do get it, uh, the, the yeah, mortality rate is, is quite high. Yeah. And um, it, it, it was much, in hindsight, much more containable. Uh, certainly it didn't go past, um, it was really focused on the West Africa nations. It didn't really go past that. So in terms of just numbers, sheer numbers, Mm -hmm. um, in hindsight, it was obviously much smaller, but, uh, and, and frail healthcare systems were really, were really struggling with it. So didn't it make its way into the U S at one point? Like there wasn't there one <laughs> or two cases or something in the Southern States. Yeah. It was a gentleman who actually, um, tra who traveled. 
Oh, okay, okay. After, um, after being exposed. Okay, cool. So you, so you go into Africa knowing that there's a 50% uh, mortality rate on this virus that's taken over West, Western Africa. Um, like what goes through your head there? Like what are the risks? What are the, why did you do it? Why did, uh, you know? Uh, well, for me, it was, I was actually um, the task force commander for the group that went over. So again, I was more of a leadership role, a health leadership role. I was not delivering, my team was delivering the care. Uh, I think at that point we had had, um, I had spent basically the last four to six months working directly with the United Kingdom um, healthcare providers, our healthcare providers. Um, they had developed the training protocols and the PPE protocols and all of this, the, the regime to stay safe over a period of time. And I think we felt just really confident that we had uh, a plan in place, both in terms of protecting our members, um, looking after patients, and having a, a robust plan in place in case someone became ill. So I, I think, you know, it's, it's a, arguably a little bit like being a firefighter and never fighting a fire. I mean, it, you, you train to deliver care to those who need it most, and you mitigate the risk and then you you go and do what you know sounds like your expertise could be needed right now why are you at home <laughs> um that's a good question i technically i'm still at the college yeah. um so uh however i've just been uh, hot off the press i've just been given um notice that one of my courses will be accommodated so that I can help out at the headquarters a little bit more. And uh, I think my expertise is probably best served in terms of planning um, and helping with the operational component and the operational um, deployment of the forces. And we're, you've probably seen it in the news. I think the big thing is just the military is getting prepared for the request for assistance from the provinces and identifying where we can be of most use and um, best utilized to, to serve the country. So it's, it's up to the government to sort of help us um, to determine where that might be and for us to give the advice on what it is we have as capabilities that might be able to be of assistance. So we're really in that phase of um, being prepared. And I think, you know, Canada is still uh, going up in terms of numbers. And I think it's going to be uh, a bit of a long road for the next few weeks, but we need to, the, from a military health services perspective, we need to figure out, not we need to figure out, we need to be prepared to provide um, our expertise where it's needed most. I think I heard on the radio this morning that uh, they sent out some uh, some troops to uh, uh, northern Quebec, or it might even northern Ontario. I might be wrong, but I think they they sent out some people there to kind of uh, get them ready for what's to come. Yeah, I think they're they're looking at sort of some of the logistical um, elements. I, I didn't hear that specifically, Reza, but I know it's it's really kind of preparing what logistical support, what health sort services support. How can we um, assist the government in areas they're underserved cool or overwhelmed mm -hmm. I, I asked that because so i know renee ahead. early or last week you just i was just kidding there colleen i know uh, i know you're still working i just renee said that your role uh your role might be changing in the next couple of weeks so i was wondering what you were up to yeah I, I mean my first thought of course with the emergency medicine background was i just i really wanted to um help out my colleagues, um, but uh, the direction was, was pretty clear that we need to be um, focused on, on delivering care where it's needed and, uh, and getting ready for that role. The, um, the, the current like, state with, with COVID, can you just explain to people why, like, I think it would be nice to hear it from an expert what exactly is so you know dangerous about about covid like i think we all kind of get the gist of it is like there's more um you know there's more at-risk citizens 
than others. Yeah. There's certain uh, there's certain populations that are at risk, and then there's certain that that aren't. And you know, a lot of people can't wrap their head around sort of why you know maybe we all need to stay inside if we're like less at risk. What's the what are sort of the major what are the major factors as to sort of why we might be all locked in our houses for the next little while? Um, but yeah, I think they're, they're still learning so much about this virus. It's, it's all happening so, so quickly. I don't think anyone could have anticipated the way this tsunami has hit Europe, the way the tsunami is sort of hitting North America right now. Um, but I, I think there's a couple of factors that need to be considered. One is um, it's a virus that's not been seen before. So absolutely everybody pretty much on the planet is vulnerable to this particular virus. Um, certainly there's a population element that there's particularly children and young adults don't seem to be as affected. I don't know that they've determined exactly why that's the case. But within the, the, the context of all the people who um, have it, we have, there's a thought process going on somewhere between 25 and 30% of folks are asymptomatic spreaders. So people who have no symptoms are carrying and shedding the virus and have absolutely no idea they're doing so. Um, and therefore, they are going around spreading to vulnerable populations without even realizing they're doing it. And um, I think that has been one of the, the complexities of this particular virus because at the beginning, it was all about if you're symptomatic, if you have a fever, if you have a cough, if you've traveled, those are the, the risk factors. And, and um, other than that, you're not going to get tested. And, and more and more, there's this recognition that there's, there's another um, layer to this that we don't, uh, that we didn't necessarily recognize as these, these asymptomatic spreaders. So keeping everyone inside today, will have an effect two weeks down the road. That's the other important element of this is most people think, well, nothing's changing, so why bother? But anything that we do today is not gonna have an impact for 10 days to two weeks. That we have to assume that every single one of us is an asymptomatic shedder. Absolutely every single one of us. So when we go out, rather than thinking, I'm, I, don't worry, I'm not gonna get it or I'm not gonna be affected, I think we need to, to flip that and sort of think, okay, I'm a shedder, so how do I avoid transmitting it to this person on the street or at the grocery store or um, anywhere else? And if we can wrap our heads around the fact that we may be the ones who are the transmitters, um, I, I think it becomes much more uh, understandable why we are all physically just dis distancing now. That's a good way of, that's a good way of looking at it. Like, hey, everyone, just assume you have this virus. And, and live your life as if you have this deadly yeah. virus, you know? Yeah. There, it, it, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, it's easier to kind of wrap your head around the precautions that way when you're, when you're next to people you care about and you're kind of going, oh, it's no, no big deal. If I get it, it's, it I'll be fine. Um, as opposed to, I don't want them to get it. I'm doing this because I care about them or that individual or that little old lady down the street. Mm -hmm. There's uh, a lot of infectious disease experts. Like if you go and, and listen to a lot of them talk, that there's like a, a, the theme is that they all think that every country reacted too late. And that it's like, you know, we saw, you know, as soon as, you know, it came up in China and then started spreading across the, the world moving west, uh, you know, we should have acted a lot earlier. Like, do you think there's any, any possible way to avoid that? Or is it just, I personally feel like there's so many, there's so much politics involved with politics and um, just disruption involved with doing something like this, that you almost need, you almost need cases in your country or, or location to justify doing it, even though at that point it's, it's no. technically probably too late <laughs> to really get push everything back. Um, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Like, were we, were we too late on this? I guess we're not going to know for another two weeks, right? Like, yeah. I, I, we'll, I mean, we'll I, never know because we are acting. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 
we'll we never... are acting sooner than than other countries so yeah. that'll that'll be hard and everything in hindsight is is obviously easy to say that it was too late or yeah. couldn't have seen this coming or whatever but yeah. i mean i think i think when I, i'll let colleen answer this but the uh i think the death the death toll is going to be more telling than the death rate right? mm -hmm. and, and every, every country basically has the same death rate uh, death toll progression every country has the same curve they say that germany is reacting quicker and it's helping the death rate yeah but from case number one to death number one to 10 to to 100 to a thousand every country is virtually the same curve mm -hmm. so it's like it doesn't really matter how many people in the country are getting tested and, and getting it it's the amount of uh, you, you, when someone dies from it it's like that's the number that is that is true right yeah. person died covid was the cause you know and that number is is what's a, it's, it's what's affecting and that's what's going to be the same in every country right, yeah I think, well i think the the there's a challenge here in as you said, uh, PT, that the idea of hindsight, um, I, I think the, even the comparison between countries becomes so, so difficult because every country is testing differently, reporting differently mm -hmm. uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, I, you know, authoritarian governments are, are not necessarily, um, the, the numbers may not uh, be as indicative of what is actually going on. I'm going to say that um, I have to be cautious about how I, how I say that, but I think when you got state controlled media and um, the numbers and, and very controlled mechanisms by which people can get tested, it's hard to really evaluate what is actually going on in those locations. And you take some of these, the countries with extremely frail health systems um, where they're fighting poverty and malaria and they're heading into influenza season and, and dealing with all of these issues, COVID-19 testing may not be at the top of their priority list for a variety of reasons. Plus then they don't necessarily have the surveillance or infrastructure to, to actually be reporting lab, even the lab infrastructure to actually be reporting what's going on. So it's, it's a, um, even comparing countries becomes extremely difficult. Um, you know, I, I think countries are, it seems like the pattern in which the, the way the, the way countries are responding, except for Sweden, maybe, um, is, is almost all the same. So everyone what is, sort what of, what does Sweden do? Uh, Sweden is not shutting much down. Oh, really? It's really fascinating, which is kind of what the UK did initially. But then they turned and, back. And then they, they changed their mind. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Sweden, as of yesterday, they were still, you know, bars and restaurants were still open. There were some minor. Oh, I didn't um, know that. Wow. It, it's probably, it's on, do you think it's because they, they, they think that they can handle their 9 million, you know, people getting sick? I, I don't know. Or like they, they look at the stats and they'll say, okay, well, if, if, if not, if imagine we all, they all have COVID, there's a certain percentage that will need care, like, and our system can essentially handle that. Can so handle we'll take it, care yeah. of it. Cause I mean, there's not that many people in Sweden, right? I'm saying 9 million. I think it's, it's not much more than that. Yeah. I don't, I don't know the population of Sweden, you know? but I think it does raise the question of, um, uh, of what will, what will, will anything differently happen there? And mm -hmm. so it's this really intense social 10.1 million. 10 .1. So yeah. I, I would suggest they probably don't have enough to handle a massive tsunami because no Western country does. Yeah. But it is interesting to see that they've, they've made a conscious decision to tackle this differently. Mm. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. watch and see. Huh. Colleen, as, as we were speaking or getting on this, um, I don't know when this is going to air, so my, this might be the only thing it does, but the Ontario government was going through the, um, their, um, their live press conference. Were you watching that at all? No, I didn't see that. What did they yeah, so say? The, the, I guess the head of uh, public health Ontario was, uh, was just like projecting numbers and he was saying that um, if nothing at all is um, done, 
I think it was a hundred thousand deaths was possible. Mm -hmm. And, and with the measure by the end of April, sorry, by the end of April, mm -hmm. hundred thousand deaths with zero precautions at all. And with the precautions that we are taking, um, depending on how severe we are and how strict we are with, with those precautions, it could range from 3,000 to 15,000. And I'm sure death by the end of April. So I, they're not going on, on death rate or, or, you know, rate of infection. They're just death, you know? Yeah, it's, so it's we were saying 3,000 to 15,000. Yeah. The, the, but the, they're kind of saying rate by giving that, that, uh, that timeline too, though, because, you know, mm -hmm. it's like within that range of time that we can handle that influx of, of potential patients into, you know, hospitals or, um, I mean, I, I, it's all, a lot of it's limited by the number of beds we have in the, in the hospital, right? Uh, Colleen, yeah. depending yeah. on, you know, what kind of care we can give these people as they start to f flow in. Yeah, and then and, and, I mean, we also have to remember it's not just about the COVID cases. This is also about the fact that people are still coming in with heart attacks and car accidents and strokes and um, you know, septic shock and all of these other things that are going on every single day. That that hasn't changed either. So this is in addition, so every bed that's taken up in the ICU with say a COVID case or a, is now, um, is not available for maybe someone with a heart attack. So it, I, yeah, sorry. it, it just affects it, the cascade effect of care, cancer patients, for example. Um, you know, there's complications from cancer treatment now um, are further complicated by the fact that if they come into a hospital, they may be get exposed to COVID. So it's, it's the, yeah, it, there's this cascade that happens. I, uh, I'd love to see, I'd love to see the, the, the stats on car accidents in the last few weeks, probably significantly down. And I that's think probably so. one, not sure. yeah. And, and that's, well, that's gotta be another reason to stay home too, right? You're, you're yeah. exposing yourself less to other risks that would get you into the hospital. Yeah. Well, Jen's been Max staying. And I, uh, okay, go ahead, Max really. and I were biking around the other day, and uh, we we saw an old man who had fallen off his bike, and he was he was banged up, like he was bleeding profusely from his head, and uh, mm -hmm. someone had already called an ambulance, and the guy who had called the ambulance didn't speak English very well, so I jumped in, and I was talking to the paramed like to the dispatch on the paramedics, and I couldn't get over the amount of questions they were asking me. Like, I'm like, you guys need to get here now. He's bleeding out of his head. He was, he was like coming in and out of consciousness. And they're like, you know, like, has he been in the, to, in the country, like out of the country? And I'm like, just all these, all these extra precautions precaution yeah. because of COVID. And I'm just like, you know, I'm trying to answer these questions as well as I possibly can. But, but at the same time, I'm just like, holy shit. Like, I would hate to to be in a situation where you, I need to rely on the public healthcare system in this moment. Like, I feel like if we weren't dealing with COVID, there would have been, a, there, there would have been an ambulance probably within five minutes, but, but because of everything that was happening, this guy, I literally was watching him bleed from his head. And I'm like talking to the paramedics, like you guys need to get here now. And they're like, we need more info, man. And I'm just like, holy shit. Like, that's crazy. I hope you applied pressure. I didn't touch him. I didn't touch him because I didn't know anything about him either. And Maddox was on the back of my bike. That's fair. So I didn't, I didn't want to get too close or anything. He had his daughter there. Um, oh. And I, I told her to apply pressure. I think he broke his hand as well because he was holding his hand real tight. Oh, and, wow. and she said that it looked banged up. But I was more concerned about like his, his head. Like he had a big contusion on his head and it was bleeding. Oh. And wow. he's an older man. And it was, it was scary. But I, I was just like, just like, holy shit, this is like, this, this COVID thing is like, it's not, it kind of gave me a better appreciation of how it kind of affects our healthcare on a bigger level, you know? But you know, what's interesting though, is by the time he got to the hospital though, he would probably receive the best and fastest care he's ever received or anyone's ever received if from emergency. Jen's been keeping in touch with some of her friends and uh, like Lindsay, DePap, Lindsay DePap was empty. Emergency, the emergency is, department's like empty. It's like the slowest wow. it's ever been because all the people who go there for nothing are staying at home. Yeah. Because yeah. usually the emergency department is filled with people who, you know, don't necessarily need to be there. You know, and they kind yeah. of clog things up a little bit. 
Wish I had my appendix right now. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, like BT said, uh, was was also all all the day to day activities that lead to minor traumas. You know, broken legs, broken arms, broken. Uh, th those aren't happening as well, uh, which uh, which changes the dynamic in the emergency department for sure. Twenty twenty has been a pretty shitty year, APT eh, so far. <laughs> It's been, uh, no, it's been good, man. I had a baby. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Global, go globally for the, for the world. Yeah. Globally. Terrible. Yeah, terrible. Yeah. And 2020, 2020 back. Good. It had, it had some real big highs and some real big lows. <laughs> yeah. Um, Colleen, what do you, what, what do you make of, uh, what do you make of all the stats, uh, showing that, you know, like 90, over 90% of, of deaths are coming from, um, people who have uh, chronic disease, like, and, you know, up to like three different diseases, um, you know, anyone that it's, it's like, it's half of them. Apparently in the stat in like Italy is like 90% of the deaths, every single one of them had either one to three comorbidities. Um, yeah. You know, and anyone that's, showing popping up on the blip as someone who's young like 40 years old you know they've got heart disease type 2 diabetes you know the list goes on uh, what do you make of all that stuff uh I, I guess it's it's an interesting conversation and i've seen uh i've heard greg glass some of greg glass and stuff and and some of the other things i think chronic disease in general is sort of that slow silent killer um mm -hmm to the majority of our population um the fact i mean part of me is like if you're 80 you probably have something going on so mm -hmm. i mean for us to get to the 60 70 or 80 with absolutely nothing wrong with us is is generally rarity but we we shouldn't be expecting that people 60 70 and 80 all have health problems right. or should all have health problems and and i think it really highlights um i guess the lifestyle changes that um have been creeping into western society for a number of years mm -hmm. i think it highlights um to me a little bit about how the health system works which is a very again a very reactive system um and i think like you guys it's it's recognizing and understanding the food lobby um the the the, the way in which um food literacy health literacy has changed over the years and what our expectations of our own health is um and, and i i think even in i go back into medical training and, and what we learned in there and i mean so little of it was on lifestyle management so little of it is done um, is proper training on how we can influence long-term outcomes. It's all about diagnosing and treating, um, or not all of it, but the majority of it is, is, is focused on that. So how could we do better um, going forward? But there's not a lot of money in prevention. Um, so I, I think this pandemic really highlights how we could evolve as both a um, how health could evolve in terms of, of improving how we live our lives, um, identifying and highlighting that we can make changes that make a difference. Um, and then on the, the flip side of that are, are you know there's there's a number of people out there who have been young who have died who had absolutely. Uh, who are young, healthy people as well. So I, I think it's also important to remember that just because someone mm -hmm. succumbed, it didn't yeah. mean that they were living an unhealthy lifestyle. I think uh, I, th I heard, I read about an infant that died the other day. It was the saddest mm -hmm. thing, you know? Um, but yeah, you, 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 you're totally right. Am Did I, anyone have any comments frozen? about all of that diatribe? No, I just think, well, one, one comment I was going to make, but then um, it was kind of a joke and then uh, it got serious. So I'm not going to make it, but uh, I think it's, uh, well, it's gonna be, there's no money in prevention except for, for, for CrossFit gym owners, right? 
But um, yeah. I mean, I have a hard time with all that thinking like, you know, well, if you're fit and you, then you'd be, you'd be okay. You know, it's like, it's not I, that easy. no, it's not, no, that, it's easy. not it, that easy. It really isn't. It really isn't. But if it takes something like COVID for like a couple people to just look at it and say like, Hey, my chances of survival would be better if I didn't have X, Y, Z condition. Like, what can I do aside from what I'm doing right now to, to better my condition or to better my, myself or, you know, to, to help me fight these things a little bit better, even though we know it wouldn't necessarily save their lives or whatever. But if it makes one person or a couple of people just think, Hey, I need to get in better shape or mm -hmm. uh, I need to try and think about reversing this type two diabetes, right? Like um, then there's a little bit of positive that comes out of that. Mm -hmm. I think. I think you just have to be, be cautious not to, lay blame um mm. through that yeah. through some of those statistics mm. and recognize that even you know this is a horrible disease no matter how you look at it and a yeah. horrible pandemic and um you know maybe there's there's things that we can do to optimize our health even as we're we're sitting in the um, so social isolation or physical distancing or however you want to call it mm -hmm. um which then brings up the whole no sugar challenge. I can't believe you guys did the no added sugar challenge over Easter. It's oh, killing man. me. You know, man, I, I mean, I have not been perfect. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. <laughs> I had I, uh, last night. I, I'll go on the record and say I had chocolate last night. <sighs> I know. Chocolate I'm, peanut butter, I've got chocolate peanut butter cake coming in about two weeks. It's hard. It's hard when you're. All, I'm not. I'm gonna put ninety percent of the blame on Jen. She she came out right from the gate. She's like, I'm not doing this with you. I was like, Oh, this, this is a losing battle. <laughs> Same. I'm 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 not gonna throw Sarah under the bus though because when she did say, I was like, Man, awesome. <laughs> she, if she doesn't want to do it, I'm not doing it. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. That's great. It's got to be a household thing, you know. So exactly. I think I think what PT said though, like kind of framing, uh, just going back to what we were talking about for a second there, um, framing it more as like these are the things that I can do to give myself better chances, you know, of survival in certain situations. Like um, in that Glassman video, like he kept he went on a little bit at the end about some other analogies that like put some light bulbs on in my head, you know, about surviving like a car crash, for example, like if mm -hmm. you're, you know, you could, you could easily make the argument that if you're healthy and in better shape, there's a number of reasons why you would have a better chance of surviving a car crash. Um, you know, right. and then the list goes on with all the different things that could potentially kill you. If you are, you know, a fit individual, you know, whether it's recovering from the surgeries or, you know, maybe you've got, uh, I don't know, more muscle on you that's going to keep your body intact in some sort of trauma, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at, if you frame it as kind of like just increasing your percentage, then it kind of takes away that, uh, the blame, you know, that you were talking about, Colleen. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it, this is PT pointed out, it's, it's, it's not all that simple. This is, you know, layers yeah. of, health literacy and food literacy and um uh you know we're super fortunate that i we can comfortably manage um social isolation and physical distancing and working at a distance and so many people out there are living um uh, you know check to check and and really don't have um the luxury to not luxury but i guess the um, it is a luxury uh, the the to to be able to do this without a lot of fear or worry mm -hmm. and um but i think layered on to that is how can we um as a, as a crossfit community as individuals who are maybe um have a, have a little bit uh more give in our lifestyles at this stage how can we help support those who don't and it, it's uh that that whole social responsibility and and um uh, commitment is is I think a really big thing that's coming out of um, the current environment, which I find really interesting as well. Mm -hmm. Well, it's refreshing to see and, and hear your point of view from someone so high up in the in our ranks in our in our military. 
Colonel. Do they call you? Do they call you Colonel at home? They call me Ma'am. 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 Colonel. <laughs> I love it. It's more like Mom. Mom. Colleen. How are you? Uh, let's let's segue into some a little bit more uh, a little bit more lighthearted now. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm getting a little depressed over here. Um, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> how do you uh, how, for all the aspiring uh, you know successful moms or you know maybe uh, maybe the the younger females out here out there who are about to get married and, and want a, a family and you know their career. They're looking at their careers ahead. How do you balance everything? How do you, you're, you're a mom at home. We always see you every day. You're hitting workouts with your husband and your, your daughter. Um, how do you balance all that? Um, I, I think uh, that's a good question. Sometimes I don't know. Uh, it, it, <laughs> it's a, I mean, in our house, it's a, it's a partnership, obviously. Um, uh, Renee is uh, extremely um, supportive of what I do. I'm supportive of what he does. And, and it comes down to a bit of give and take both, uh, in terms of our scheduling and how to manage, um, over the years, I think I kind of looked at it from the point of view of there's going to be, um, highs and lows. I mean, there's going to be times where, uh, I had to not do very much working out for periods of time. And then when I have the opportunity, I sort of pick it up. A lot of it is um, slowly, very deliberately making sort of personal um, and family goals. So if there's, you know, maybe this next six months, I'm not going to be able to do something that I want to do, but maybe over the next year or, or something, sort of setting, setting some personal and family goals as we go. Um, What's an yeah, example Yeah, just slow, deliberate progress and yes. just... What's trying an to, sorry, I keep on ahead. cutting. I was going to say, can you give us an example of a of a personal and family goal? Like, what are you, what are you working on now? Um, well, I mean, right now, I think our goal in this house, so Renee just went back to work. Um, so you know, trying to maintain a routine Monday to Friday, so that you know, Gabrielle's doing a little bit of school work every single day that we get up around the same time each day that we hit the 9 a.m. workout. Gigi and I hit it as a, uh, uh, as a family. And, um, and then, you know, so, so a lot of what we're doing immediately is just um, maintaining schedules and routines and keeping fitness as a priority uh, in the house and eating right as a priority. Cause I think uh, as, um, your other guest uh, mentioned sometimes times of stress are the times when we actually need to be eating right the most and looking after ourselves the most. And that's when we do it the least. Um, specifically on a CrossFit perspective, just trying to get over some old injuries and get stronger and uh, keep working on those handstand pushups. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, I, I just want to jump in there and just say, I think people don't really know how much of an OG you are in terms yeah. of CrossFit as well. And like, you know, we mentioned Renee, we had Renee on the podcast. We talked about Parliament CrossFit and everything. Uh -huh. You guys, you guys were the first or the second, I, I keep saying first, because it's the first one that I ever heard of um, affiliate in Ottawa, Parliament CrossFit. And, uh, yeah. and we see Parliament CrossFit every single day on those virtual classes, you know, that garage. So it's really <laughs> cool. It's really cool to see that, you know, you trans basically you transitioned from uh an affiliate owner right you an affiliate owner about 10 years ago where you weren't in the master's category or were you or well, i think i've been in the master's category since i started oh no i guess they didn't get well when i started i was i was 2005 yeah so i mean so like I actually, you weren't i don't mean like in a sense of of, of competing necessarily just like no, you know when, when you started it was pack. yeah it was but it was like you started to work out and have fun and, and, yeah. and stay in shape. And then you transition. And as age goes on, like you've been doing it for 10, 15 years almost, and you're still doing it and you're still loving it and it's still keeping you fit. And you're, yeah. you know, you're still trying to get better at different things. And it's, uh, I think it's really cool to see. I think people sh should know that you're, you're a real OG. People think, people think we're OGs. I'm like, no, 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 no. There's people who were doing it much before we were. Yeah. Hey, Pauline, your ability to, like I feel like I'll go months without without seeing you, 
And then you just like, like we recently did the masters qualifier together and I'm just like, how is Colleen like still crushing these workouts? Man? Like, she's still killing it. Like she just, I think did we, we did one of them together. Didn't we? Did we do the handstand push up one together? No, you went right before me. You went right before me. And I remember sitting there watching you and I was just like, like, damn, like amazing. No quit. No. Yeah, that was funny because you asked me if you uh, if I was prepared for this year's, and I was like, I, uh, going back and forth to Toronto this year has been a harder harder to train. I missed the six a.m. classes and that that community and that social aspect. But then you said, well, I didn't think you were prepared last year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how did you do this year? Uh, I think like fortieth or something. That's like legit. That's so good. Yeah, yeah better than the world. how I did. Where'd yeah. you come, Russ? I don't want to talk about it, man. <laughs> like 67? <laughs> That's still pretty good. Top 100 in the world. That's great. Yeah, I guess. Awesome. Cool. The, the, the top awesome. 10 guys, though, it's crazy, their scores. Like, they're insane. They're just super fit. Yeah, they're yeah. crazy fit. Yeah. We'll get I, it next year, Reza. Let's do it. Well, All isn't right. Nick your anchor in your category? He's, like, winning your category. Mm-hmm. I don't even know. I don't think he won, man. No. It was, it was it. funny. It was funny because it was, that was the first weekend when we decided to close the gym. Right. And, uh, I remember following the leaderboard and the guy who was in first place was, was actually from Italy. And at that, like, I mean, Italy's just been like, at that point, Italy was in shambles and they still are. But I remember thinking to myself, like, that's wild. This guy's in Italy. Like we're scrambling to get these workouts in and the fittest guy right now, it, it, he ended up getting bumped down. But at the time I looked, he was in first place. He was from Italy. That's good for him. Yeah. Wow. Cool. I don't have any more questions. Do you guys have any more questions for Colleen? Yeah, no, that was great. No, thanks, Paul. I, I just wanted to say thanks for sitting down with us, uh, Colleen. You're a, you're a valued member of our, of our community, and we really appreciate it. Oh, thanks, thanks guys. And uh, I had fun. This was, uh, this was great to sit down with you guys and chat about some of this stuff. Thanks so much. So we'll continue with virtual NCR. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Virtual right. stay, stay, <laughs> yeah. stay, stay fit. We'll see you okay. at, the, at the 9 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Saturday, Pete. Wait, no, it's Saturday. I'm yeah, losing track Saturday. of the days. <laughs> <laughs> Monday. Right. Okay, bye. Bye, guys. Bye. See ya.